In this episode, you'll learn how you can take co-creation to the next level based on lessons from the Swiss direct democracy. This promises to be a good one. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Peter, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode has a passion for business, technology, and human-centered design, and he's the co-founder of the Service Design Network chapter in Switzerland. His name is Peter Horvat. So when Peter reached out to me and proposed to talk about the Swiss direct democracy, I was immediately intrigued because usually lessons from outside of the design field brought into design give us new insights on how we can do our work better. At least it helps us to ask different questions. So the goal of this episode and what you'll be hearing about is how we can actually improve our co-creation process based on the lessons from the Swiss direct democracy. If this is your first time here on this channel, I'd love to have you to subscribe because we bring new videos that help to level up your service design skills at least once a week. That's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the really interesting chat with Peter. Welcome to the show, Peter. Hi, Mark. Welcome hey, to be here. Good to see you. Uh, we're going to talk about some really interesting uh, stuff that we haven't covered on the show in the previous 85-ish uh, episodes, I think. So uh, No always, pressure, right? No <laughs> pressure, no pressure at all. Peter, um, we've known each other uh, through uh, the service design community, and I think you're also a member of one of the courses that I run. But for the people who don't know who you are, can you give like a 30-second introduction? Sure, Mark. Um, so my name is Peter Horvath. I'm currently based in Switzerland, Geneva. Uh, originally, I am from Hungary. I've also spent some time in Canada. Um, I am uh, by training an economist, but please don't hold that against me. Uh, I've been uh, active in the digital uh, space throughout my career, and I have worked in uh, consulting, uh, freelance, and also in uh, agencies. I have worked uh, with enterprises as well and in startup uh, ecosystems as well. Um, most recently, I have uh, concluded the uh, MBA program of uh, EPFL, which is the, uh, the Swiss uh, Institute of Technology. <clears throat> and this was focused on the management of technology and innovation. So something quite uh, well-fitting the, the service design uh, topic. I'm right now a freelance uh, service design and digital strategy consultant. And I am on the side also the, uh, the co-founder of uh, the Service Design Network's Swiss chapter, and I lead the, uh, the biggest and most active um, meetup community here in uh, Geneva around the topics of digital strategy and user experience. Wow, that's, that's, uh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> it's a handful, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it balances yeah. out. Sometimes there's stuff to do on one and sometimes stuff to do on the other. In, in re regarding service design, what is your first experience with, with service design? When did that happen? So I, I dreaded that question since the time that I've been listening to your podcast, <laughs> but I'm happy that there are also other people who say that, you know what, Mark, I can't really remember. And mm. I have to admit that as well, that I can't really remember. It was uh, some time around uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, it was uh, some of my uh, colleagues uh, then at, uh, at an agency, or ex-colleagues rather, uh, who, who pointed it uh, out to me. Um, and, you know, I started looking into it and, and it seemed like, yeah, like that's, that's kind of what the interesting thing is. Hmm. And quite early on, I've been looking at uh, sort of this combination of digital strategy and user experience. And what I see is that, and some people are surprised that I see it, say this, is that they are really the same thing. Because they ensure that the people flow through a series of touch points, which are predefined, but also need to be dynamic. And they fulfill both needs of the organization and the person. And it's really the scope that uh, that differs because in strategy or digital strategy, it's a bit wider scope. And in terms of user experience design, if we think about it as the interfaces, then it's a bit more defined. And service design is really the same thing. It connects, you know, the uh, the user interface design and the usability and the the strategy of an organization. I think this already will uh, raise some questions for people listening. And uh, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> let's not go into that right now because we sure. have you. We're going to talk about a topic that is dear to your heart. You've been uh, researching it for the last 12, 18 months, 
and it has to do with the country you're right now in Switzerland, right? So exactly. let's not give too much away, but this will be uh, really interesting. Uh, again, the question that I ask most of the people, are you ready to do some interview jazz, Peter? I am ready. <laughs> okay, drum roll. So here we go. And let's start with this first topic. It's the topic of direct democracy. And All right. can you show us your question starter? Of course, and that will be why, mm -hmm. and more, uh, more in more detail, why do people really don't know too much about direct democracy? I have to be honest, I never heard about direct democracy until you mentioned it. It's perfect, so then the, the, perfect, uh, the, the question is perfectly <laughs> fitting. So uh, Switzerland has a, uh, or is a country that has, uh, officially it's a semi-direct democracy. Very often it's referred to as, as being the best example of direct democracy. And direct democracy basically means really power by the people. And uh, it goes back really to the origins of, of democracy and how it should be handled, or how it was originally seen as power by people. And then really the representative democracy, if we can say that, stepped into its place a bit. Meaning that, okay, instead of uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people coming together and, and having discussions around how things should be handled, people are elected to do that sort of representation of their communities. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, the, what, Switzerland has these. So Switzerland has a parliament uh, and, and uh, has a government. Both are a bit uh, strange. Um, and, uh, and on the side, uh, Switzerland is a direct democracy, meaning that the three traditional branches of power, if you have it, the, you know, the parliament, government, and the courts, there's a fourth power to this, which is the people. And, you know, this is quite rarely pointed out this specifically, that the fourth power is people. But if you look at it, that is the fact. Um, the, the way that this is done, uh, the two main things that really set apart Switzerland and its direct, define its direct democracy is, on, is the referendums. And the two main, there are three types of referendums, mm -hmm. but the two are mm -hmm. the most important here. One is where citizens, a, a small group of citizens, say seven people, can propose any change to the constitution. And uh, if there are certain uh, you know, barriers defined, you, know, you need to have it, uh, a set number of uh, signatures and so on, and then at the end, people vote about it. But basically, if these barriers are, are you know, jumped through, then their proposal will go through and will be part of the, um, of the constitution. And the other part, quite the opposite, is that whatever uh, law comes out of parliament, uh, there's a set uh, amount of time during which um, the, any one person or even a group of uh, people can uh, can attack that law and say, I do not like that, let's not have that. And mm -hmm. so basically during that period, anyone can, can challenge this law. And again, there are, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a signature collection and then there's voting. But basically if these steps are done, then that law will not enter into force at that time. It may be revisited later, but at that point it is challenged. And the combination of these two give people in Switzerland, so citizens, the power of first and final say, because they can you know, initiate legislation and they can also challenge anything that comes out of the parliament. Uh, yeah, so that's, is Switzerland like the only country that has a system like that? Or have you found... So there, there are other countries as well. And just, you know, to put a bit more context, uh, you know, my primary research wasn't really a political mm -hmm. focus one, mm -hmm. but a uh, commercial focus one. And we'll get into that later yeah. in the show. But no, there are other countries who do this. And if I say referendums and that these are referendum types, then most people will say, yeah, we have referendums. And actually, <clears throat> I know, I know uh, one that they had in England. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and we can get back to that because it's, it's interesting. Uh, but there are... Uh, um, similar tools being used in multiple countries, you know, my home country, Hungary, being one of them as well, which has referendums. What really sets Switzerland apart is on one side that these referendums are binding. Hmm. In most countries, not all of them, there's, there, there are, I mentioned three and I explained two, but there are multiple variations to these. But the point is that most of them are binding, meaning that if this, this and this happens, then it needs to get done. And in many countries, referendums are sort of like a, a recommendation that the government or parliament can listen to and they can say, yeah, that sounds nice, but not right now. Or, or just say, yeah, we heard you, but sorry, we have more important hmm. things to do. 
Is, is that why you also mentioned that it's a, a real Ford power because it's binding? Yes, right. exactly. And uh, um, one of the things also, if you, you look at uh, that in, uh, in Switzerland, there's no real constitutional court power that is basically taken over by the people because if there's something in the constitution that you know people don't like, they can change it. If there's something that seems to talk against uh, uh, the constitution, then people can challenge that law. So there's this is basically replaced a bit uh, like this. Um, and yeah. there are other yeah. countries, as mentioned, that use this. But what's really interesting is that in Switzerland, there are more referendums than in the rest of the world combined. So <laughs> it's very, on one side, it's, it's, it's labor binding. intensive. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It is labor intensive, but not as much as you would think. At least that's the information that I got. But on one side, it's binding, and on the other side, it's very heavily used versus other countries. So um, maybe be a step up to the next topic before we dive into that. What made you decide to think and look at direct democracy in the context of service design? Sure. So that was the fact that I see direct democracy really as a... Uh, as a next level version of co-creation, hmm. because basically that is, if you if we think about um, um, service design or uh, or similar um, you know topics, one of the core elements is that it's heavily co-creative, uh, involving and talking with the customers, getting their point of view is something that's heavily used, and okay. this yeah. is similarly done in uh, in service in, in Swiss direct democracy. But, in, you know, it's not perfect and in a slightly different way, but also in a way that's extremely unique. Hmm. The fact that people have such a, or citizens have such a power on the parliament and government is very rare. And uh, what I like is that Switzerland is often even being referred to in political context as something either, you know, rare or something that, according to political theory, shouldn't exist. <laughs> and yet it's been here for a while. So the the direct democratic um, processes have started to arise around 150 years ago or a bit more and uh, have been in power for around 130 years. So, you know, it's it's been around. It's not that it was a, you know, decade-long experiment and it, and it mm. failed. No, mm -hmm. it's, it's been around. You can argue whether it's perfect or not, mm -hmm. but it's, it's something interesting. Mm. And when looking at involving people, involving customers or constituents in the decisions of an organization, there are many books that come not from a service design or co-creation perspective, but from more from a business per perspective, yet argue for the inclusion of, uh, of people, of customers. Many of these books or papers often point out that people should be listened to, but it's not that we should do everything they say. And, um, you know, not doing everything they say is one thing, but then the we are a bit at the other extreme, meaning that all the decisions currently uh, regarding the input from customers is really in the hands of the company, meaning that we are, you know, companies are a bit using their customers when and how they like without really giving any binding um, hmm. um, you know, processes behind, yeah. behind it. So <clears throat> I think uh, you're already making the, um, the transition into, <laughs> into the topic. <clears throat> Uh, which we, I think, could pick this one, co-creation, because the, the, that's the interesting uh, part, I guess. Like, direct democracy is a form of a co-creation, but uh, I'm really curious what your questions are around co-creation as we know it within service design. Yep, so I'm looking let's see. at... Uh, yeah, mm. so let's look at this, maybe... Uh, how can we uh, embed uh, co-creation uh, more strongly into an organization? Hmm. And you know, starting with that question, the one of the uh, the elements is okay. Should we even do that, or or why should we do that? So I, I went through a um, for uh, and you know this is the this was the topic of my thesis, basically looking at combining co-creation and Swiss direct democracy and what can be learned from one and for the other. And the, um, the piece here is that, okay, how is co-creation defined? What are its elements? Yeah, and yeah. if we would want to embed it more strongly into an organization, how could we mm, convince uh, senior stakeholders, the management, to do that? And so what I did, I went through a, a number of books and papers around co-creation, which also, some of them also look at multiple 
um, you know, papers and really do a um, synopsis of like bringing together all the previous thoughts and then defining where we are. And it's interesting that there is an arc to co-creation. And uh, in services, the involvement of customers was initially looked at as, you know, a, like a, a pesky little thing, like uh, they were... <laughs> Not seen as someone who can contribute, but rather someone who disturbs the uh, uh, the, the service process with you know, unknown elements, uh, and that then involved uh, or evolved into involving customers as uh, temporary workers, so to mm-hmm. say, uh, using the the resources there, and then more and more it's coming to a point where it's strategic uh, inclusion, meaning that you know they are not just there for you know putting together the IKEA table. But there maybe are also there for defining what the table should be like or whether should it, it's really a table that is needed. Hmm. And uh, so more and more coming from this being seen as a disturbance to, to being seen as a resource, to being seen as a strategic resource is the arc. And I would argue that that's not, you know, really, it's not over yet, this evolution. Because if you think about it, people, customers have been getting more and more say within what an organization does. And uh, I would argue that as people in any situation get more and more of something, they expect that as a minimum and then a bit more if, uh, if you want to, to satisfy their needs. And um, this will lead to the fact that people, in my view, will start you know, slowly demanding that it's okay. Like, you know, you've been asking me, you know, uh, surveys and workshops and whatnot, but I, I get a really small view. I want to know where that survey led, like what happened then or my or the workshop that I participated in what happened after. And also to a point where it's not just that, hi, dear customer, I'm the company and I would like to involve you in this, but also have the opportunity to say, hi, company, I'm the customer and I would like to discuss this and this. So there, there should be or, or will be, in my view, a, um, a continuation where this will become the expectation uh, for, for this dialogue will be even stronger from the, uh, from the customers towards the companies. How how would you describe the current state of co-creation within with let's let's keep the boundaries to service design like it was maybe just getting feedback and getting uh, uh, survey results like getting the, the 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 qualitative data how what is the general tendency towards co-creation within service design right now how would you describe that I mean it's it's definitely uh, uh, getting you know stronger and. I do think that co-creation cannot be separated from service design because sure. almost any kind of discussion includes the the customers in a way that it could be looked at a as could be looked at as a co-creation, but maybe at a lower level. Which brings us to an interesting part is that we can look at you know a service delivery as a you know probably it's a circular thing, but as a process which starts mm-hmm. from ideation, then validation, and goes on to uh, to delivery and then usage and uh, repeat mm-hmm. usage. Um, and we can also look at it at co-creation as having various levels. So one level of co-creation is really this, you know, just a survey or something where there is a discussion, but there's not, you know, a real, really high level of, of engagement from the uh, uh, from the audience and from the customers. And then there's a higher level where where there is strong inclusion in terms of workshops and people spend, you know, potentially even multiple days there with the company uh, or or repeatedly come into discussions. Mm-hmm. And there could and should be probably an even higher level where this is proactive. And mo- many of the um, um, co-creation or many pieces of co-creation literature argue around this. That's what's really important uh, for co-creation is having some sort of platform where this dialogue can be had. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, what I also did is I looked at, okay, what are these specifics, what's this, let's say specific layers of co-creation, which includes things like, um, you know, drivers, like what drives an organization towards adapting co-creation and what the mindset of the organization should be all the way down to how its measurement is done. And uh, there are a few things that are well-defined. So, for example, what the mindset of an organization should be is well-defined in, the, in uh, publications in general. Also, um, a lot of the drivers are, are quite well-defined, uh, but there are a few things that are not so well defined and many publications even point this out. One of them being measurement, which is in terms of co-creation, there, there, the, the really, you know, there's not yet a strong collection of KPIs that are specific to co-creation. 
And uh, that, of course, you know, the, the, the fact that dri- some drivers are well-defined, but it's not really from a, from, let's say, manager perspective. Like it, it often lacks numbers. It, it lacks, uh, you know, what kind of numbers? numbers? Like, so for example, you know, increased revenue or, 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 or time mm-hmm. to market or anything mm-hmm. like that. The, it's even strange because there are, there are some uh, publications that argue that doing co-creation will mean that the organization functions, you know, will be quicker mm-hmm. and will be more efficient. And then there are some other publications who say the exact opposite, that right. because we're involving people, it will be, you know, it will take a bit yeah. longer yeah. and and it may be a bit more, less efficient as well. But in the end, it will be better, but mm-hmm. getting there will, will take a while. So that is not yet fully uh, sort of defined or reassuringly done. And another part is is the measurement, which is like, okay, what's, what should we measure? How can we say that, you know, we started co-creation at the beginning and then looking at what we defined as KPIs and at the end, we are there. So those things are, are questions that, you know, also looking at the uh, everything that, that we learned at the MBA is that if you are trying to convince uh, the organization, you should have, you know, your numbers straight and not just the, uh, just the theory or mm. the, uh, the qualitative arguments behind it. Yeah. So yeah. So let's say that this is like the current state of co-creation. Uh, we know where it's coming from. We sort of know where it's heading. Uh, but I would like to dig into the third topic because this will probably create a bridge. And this third topic is commercial setting. Yeah. I'm expecting that this will be the bridge between uh, direct democracy and the current state of co-creation and how we can use things from the one in the other so yeah, so let me let me use this what if uh, so what if we could um, we could use or learn or handle swiss direct democracy as a case study of uh, of co-creation which gives more power to let's say customers or citizens in this case than what you would normally think of as ex- acceptable or even uh, you know used yeah so let, and, let, it, this is like exploring a future scenario like in exactly. Direct democracy, Swiss direct democracy applied to a commercial organization. Yes, and as it, it's very often argued that when you, you know, when you do uh, service design or, or user experience design, you should, you know, look at of course what people usually do, but you should also look at outliers and sure. define specifically mm-hmm. for those as well. And uh, Swiss direct democracy is one of these outliers in, in inclusion of uh, stakeholders. And granted, it's a it's a quite a drastic one. But as it is a drastic one, it's worth looking at. Sure. And what did and, you find? Uh, yeah. So what I find is that if we recall this matrix of, you know, the, the whole process of, of um, service delivery and then the, the levels of how much co-creation there is, then uh, Swiss direct democracy is really good at the beginning and top, uh, meaning that at uh, the ideation and the validation phase, it's really strong in co-creation because people have very few barriers to be able to propose something and, you know, jumping a bit ahead, even if, um, um, even if a, a, a proposal from the people, from citizens doesn't go through and in the end doesn't get voted by the people, it still enters political debate. And that's one of the important elements of, uh, of these, of the system is that it didn't go through because maybe, you know, it wasn't properly defined or it was too early. But it's now in the mind of um, in the public mind, and it's in the mind of uh, parliament or and government and politicians, and they can they can think about it, and and you know it, it could be picked up later on, and uh, it's it's strong there in, in this identification of uh, issues and of validating something, as you know, if a law comes out from parliament, people have the right to challenge it, um, so the the validation is there. What's not really there is afterwards. So at that point, really, uh, in Swiss direct democracy, the initiators are no longer officially involved in the process. And there have been even cases where those who initiated a, a vote or mm-hmm. a, a referendum, mm-hmm. they attacked the law that came out of it mm. because they argued it was not in <laughs> the original, it, it, it did not follow the original idea of, yeah, of yeah. that proposal. So, so that happens as well. And, and this really calls out the importance of co-creation. So if we involve someone at only the very beginning and then, you know, don't really co-create it, but mm-hmm. just ask them, they give you something and then you implement that, maybe talking with internal stakeholders, sure. it might become something that they never wanted. 
So really what this shows is that it's important to be able to get the input from customers or citizens, but also to follow through. And that is still a, a bit of a gap in, um, in, di in direct democracy or in the Swiss version of direct democracy. And what I did, I sort of, I created a uh, kind of process that takes the most important learnings from direct democracy, but adds on levels to it that are missing so that in a commercial organization, this could be used. And one of those things, for example, is uh, is the fact that this uh, inclusion of the of the people who propose it should be kept, and 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 uh, the 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 connection should be kept all the way until implementation. There should be some discussions. Another element that, for example, is missing uh, in um, in direct democracy in Switzerland, but is very heavily pointed out in co-creation literature is that it should be an experience and it should be looking at the emotions as well as the information and the data. For the people who are participating in the process? On one side, who are the people and really, you know, what what do they feel like uh, when participating in it? Exactly. So yeah. in, in, in Swiss direct democracy, you know, you have the power to change the constitution, but the way that the process is actually done is is very bureaucratic there there's no let's say little celebrations there right, is no right, delights right. in there and that is something that if an organization does this then there should be a sort of you know a, a frame of experience that collects all of this and the you know usual things like um, uh, peak and uh, experience sure. are are pointed uh, or pointed out and that the brand itself is somehow you know implemented in mm -hmm. there or or bounded into it meaning that if it's a playful a brand, then at least the words that describe this uh, participation should be playful or the discussion should be somewhat playful. Mm. And it's a serious one, then it should be serious. But this is not really heavily used in, in direct democracy in Switzerland. Now, let's take let's take one step further. I think a lot of uh, people listening to the show will sort of agree that uh, co-creation, we, we see the value of that. And we already struggle to get participants for our workshops and to get internal stakeholders to participate. If I go to uh, my client and say, I want to increase the level of co-creation, we'll, we'll just probably need a little bit more time and a bit more budget. How, are, how am I going to actually, what is the first step to implementing in the next level of co-creation? Maybe that's the better question. Yep. Well, that's a uh, not a small question, but let me start by looking at the participation. So if you look at... Um, you know Switzerland, and as you mentioned, like it's a it's a heavy process, right? There's a it, lot of it, it seems like yeah. There's there's um, um, referendums about four times a year uh, normally, and at every referendum, people vote on multiple topics, and that topics are sometimes municipal, sometimes on a cantonal level, which is the regions within Switzerland, which are quite by, by the way very strong, or they might be you know at the very highest level um, regarding the whole the whole country or all the cantons. And what, uh, what's um, interesting is that looking at the participation in referendums, it's quite low. It can range from as low as around 30% to as much as about 80%. Uh, but, you know, going high is, is more rare. So it's yeah. usually more between, the, between 40 and 50%. And when looking at, and this might be if someone looks up, you know, Switzerland, inclusion of people, uh, one of the good things that can be uh, by which countries can be compared is participation in uh, in elections. Mm -hmm. And Switzerland is one of the lowest uh, election uh, percent has okay. one of the lowest yep. uh, election percentages. But it's important to point out that elections, so election of the parliament, is not as important in Switzerland as in other countries, precisely because people have other means to make their voices heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, it is true that, um, you know, uh, looking at individual referendums, the participation can be argued is not very high. But there's been a lot of research around this. Uh, and th it's also argued that within any five year period, 90 percent of the people vote, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. means that, you know, it might be that I don't want to participate in a referendum because I'm happy either way. And I, I just don't feel that I need strongly that I need to express my opinion. But even the even the lowest numbers of thirty percent participation, which you know from a democratic perspective looks very frighteningly low, if we look at um, you know, traditional numbers in participation in digital platforms, for example, it's usually argued that there's one percent 
and 10%. So 1% mm. being the, the yeah. heavier users yeah. Yeah. and 10% being the more active ones. And then the you know, rest of the 89%, they don't really participate. Yeah. In some cases, this is, these are even lower numbers. Uh, so it needs to be pointed out that, yes, there, there is this part that needs to be figured out. And what kind of a uh, brand are we? How much do we include the, the customers? Because if you want to get this to this next level of co-creation or participation of customers, what you need to realize is that you need to, you know, you need to crawl before you can fly. Mm-hmm. See, it's, it's a gradual process. And if you want to say that, okay, we are giving our customers the power to propose um, some new feature. Sure. And we guarantee that if X percent of the people vote and participate, then it will be rolled out. Well, before that, you need to make sure that people are, that, you know, do you have a strategy? Is it clear what your organization wants to do? Are the customers well defined? Like who who is your target audience? Because if those two things are missing, and you know, there's a number of prerequisites that your organization should have before going to the next level. And one of them is, you know, is your strategy clear internally and also externally? Do customers know what you are trying to be and fulfill as an organization? What your role in their life is and what your role in generally in, in, in the world is. Because that's really important for them to be able to propose things that make sense for the organization and also for the organization to be able to say, to push back on some proposals saying, we are not that organization and you know it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mm -hmm. it it doesn't count. Yeah, you don't want people driving your organization in a direction that doesn't align with who you are. Exactly. (laughs) Right. And that's one of the things that, for example, in Switzerland, direct democracy has it's to some degree no limitations because apart from sure. the fact apart from the um, definition of when or you know how mm-hmm. uh, people can participate there's hardly any limitations on what people can propose there have been proposals to say let's abolish the army yeah so or change they, the flag <laughs> I don't well, think they would do that. They really, no, but, they really like their. But yeah. it, exactly, they could change. They could propose to change the flag, change yeah, the yeah, number yeah. of the uh, yeah. the parliament. Like there's a lot of things mm-hmm, that people mm-hmm. could propose with hardly any limitations. So they really started broad, and there were a few efforts. I wouldn't say that they wanted to limit uh, the the uh, the freedom of people, but they wanted to look at okay, would it make sense to say that to to introduce some more uh, pieces in there and. As soon as sort of people found out that this is even a topic being considered, there was a big uproar. So basically, there's no movement. There's mm-hmm. no mm-hmm. space to, to fine-tune this. Right now, it's almost everything, and there's very little chance of that being reduced. So, so if an yeah. organization wants to do something like this, they should rather start the other way around. Mm. They should define a topic that is important enough for people to, um, you know, to be involved uh, to be, you know, um, motivated to be involved and to co-create it. But the uh, company really is willing to say that, okay, if a change in that topic comes from people, then then we will implement it. Yeah, that's what that's exactly the question I wanted to ask. And maybe you have a brief answer to that. Like, how important is that binding, binding aspect? I think it's very important to, on one part, know how far you theoretically would be willing to go as an organization. But at the same time, be able to define where you would, where you could start. What is the sort of smallest thing that still makes sense uh, for people, but you are willing to basically give up some control in, because that is the whole uh, whole you know end point of of uh, co-creation is you are not fully in control. But there are um, multiple publications and books coming from uh, you know from from business consultants uh, of uh, you know well renowned uh, consultancies going back 15 years, who have argued that strategy is no longer about a singular person or a small group of people knowing where to go. Mm-hmm. Rather, it is navigating in fog, as they put it. And, uh, you know, if some companies or people might still live in the, the previous era where they think that, you know, they know best. And, you know, there might be geniuses and, and genius uh, CEOs who really do know best. For them, it's probably not, not the, the right thing. But more people think they are a genius than who actually are. Hmm. And so very often it is this navigating in the fog and, uh, and, and you know, being able to include as many points of, view as, uh, points of view as possible. And that really then requires you to, to give up some control, not because 
you are forced to give up, but you never really had it in the first place. You just mm. thought you have it, mm. but really, you know, sharing this uh, this control and this, uh, you know, finding of the, the the direction or the specific steps is something you can give up. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Well, sort of maybe that's uh, if if we have to summarize why co-creation. Well, the, when complexity increases, when the number of var variables increases. Uh, it's less likely that you have all the answers and that you actually... Exactly. I mean, right? there's, there's a lot of discussions saying that we no longer have industries. We have arenas. Like, what industry is Facebook in? What industry is Google in? Sure, it, yeah. yeah. It's very hard to define. And many of the, you know, startups nowadays are trying to fight for, you know, not fitting into one industry. Um, so that's just one of the things. The other thing is that customers are, are becoming um, you know, much more professional customers they have mm. more choice they understand more and as it's argued that the the younger generation to to the younger generation it comes more natural to challenge companies just as people you know initially in history were you know were ready to to be controlled by the king or government and now and more and more throughout the decades there have been there has been more sure. yeah. you know, changes being requested similarly this the same is happening around organizations that customers you know they they want to have a say in in, in what happens mm -hmm. so they they have more choice and if it's not done by one company they can go to another one yeah so there's many of these uh these things but this is what i pointed out earlier around the co-creation drivers is that some of these things are quite clear it's hard to argue around some of these things it's hard to also put a number to it but at the same time, there's some books and publications who argue that this will come, but it might take a few more decades. So mm. it's not that, you know, this will be mm -hmm. a five-year process. And even if the, those books were written, you know, 15 years ago, some of them argue that it will take 40 to 50 years sure. until this really happens. And as with many other things, there are companies who are, who are already doing it. There are um, companies who have people vote on on their decisions. Now, whether that's you know done ad hoc or whether it's done in the right way is another question. What, for example, Swiss Direct Democracy really does well or is really done well here is the inform informing people. Uh, so there's a, uh, it's called the Red Booklet, which really uh, summarizes the decisions in, in a one pager. It has some illustrations to it. There's also videos. Uh, there's also a minority report, <laughs> meaning mm -hmm. that, okay, in in Parliament, you know, how much are for or against this decision? So there's a lot of uh, uh, things that are being proposed to people or, or presented to people to understand it quickly. But also all the details are proposed or, or shown to those who are more interested. So, you know, if you just ask, and there was an example like this where a company was asking uh, you know, which platform should we use for whatever? Like, people will not necessarily know about your backend unless your users are all developers, mm -hmm. in which mm -hmm. case, sure, mm -hmm. go for that. But, you know, elements like informing, that needs to be there very heavily to ensure that people actually know what they're making a decision on. So uh, I think that it's clear that we're heading in that direction. There are <clears throat> We're getting the means, the culture is developing. Uh, uh, there, there is still a lot to be put in place. Uh, I would be curious, like, if you could ask the people watching and listening to the show one question, what is it that we should be thinking about or what should we comment upon in this episode? Sure. So uh, I do have a, uh, a blog that I'm writing yeah, about. Yeah, we'll link to that for sure. Yeah. Can, if we can link to that. And I'll also, for those who are more pressed time, uh, more pressed for time, I'll uh, write uh, it up in a Medium article and then we can link to that as well. Absolutely. But basically, you know, one question that we can start discussing about already here is, um, do, you see, or do you see in your organization that senior management is really devoted into... Um, um, to including customers in at a higher level and not just at a point where, yes, sure, let's send out surveys. Sure, yeah. And I think what's one of the important things that is missing in, um, in co-creation literature are the processes that really ensure that, you know, people, uh, customers, if they want something to happen, that there's a process both visible and known to them as well as the organization that is transparent but potentially there's also binding, something that they know is worth pursuing because there will be something coming out at the end of it. 
if you look at like there's really a few really interesting uh, very recent examples so very on two sides one being facebook who recently um started introducing or talking about having a um a group of people to who people can uh, uh, can send their arguments if they want something to remove to be removed mm-hmm. uh, from uh, from Facebook as a content. I see that as a very archaic approach to it. I don't think it's it. I don't think it's um, uh, that Facebook. It, it's really on Facebooky to come up with something so very, you know, um, I don't know, governmental type and something that just smells of slowness and inefficiency. <laughs> but it shows that there's. Hopefully they're not doing it just for as an excuse, but that there is a willingness even from that kind of organization to put a process in place. Hmm. And then a very different example is uh, the recent Sonic the Hedgehog movie where the trailer came out, the internet uproared like, what does Sonic look like? It's terrible. And uh, the, uh, uh, the studio completely redesigned what Sonic looks like and did a completely new CGI character. And now the internet is like, yeah, let's watch this film just so that we can show them right. that we right. really, really appreciate them listening to us. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, this is chance. Like, you know, what are the odds that you know people in comments start writing, yeah, this character is ugly, and then they um, actually do it. Movie yeah. studio says, yeah. okay, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll just redo it. Yeah. It's random. Yeah. So, is there a chance in your organization? to ensure a process that becomes binding for inclusion mm. of customer uh, voice and the co-creation yeah, of that so, process. So I would be really interested if we get some comments on examples slash case studies of organizations that have some kind of process where you as a customer can actually I- invoke changes that might potentially be binding. I would be interested to see some examples if they are. Right. Likewise. Likewise. Okay. And there are yeah. some I know sp- uh, scattered around there, and I'm really you know, don't give any hints. Let's see what community. people come up with. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'll absolutely link to your uh, blog with uh, the research done in the past one and a half years because I think there is much more to be said and learned about this topic and how to be applied. So it will be somewhere in the show notes. Peter, um, thanks so much for making us curious about taking co-creation to the next level because i think this is what it is Um, it's not the end it's just the start of this new journey so yeah thanks for sharing what you've been thinking about for the last 18 months mark thank you very much for having me it's been a pleasure cool thanks so do you have any examples of businesses that have embedded co-creation in such a way that customers actually have an influence on what the business does we would love to see some examples so leave your comments down below if you enjoyed this episode please grab the link and share it with somebody who might find it interesting as well that will help us to grow the service design show community thanks for watching and if you want to see more click this next video because we're going to continue over there see ya